Hello everyone. Today we're going, to, we're going to talk about one of the most common procedures on our labor ward and that is augmentation of labor. Augmentation of labor is a stimulation of contractions that are considered inadequate because of health cervical dilatation and fetal descent. Um, it is different from induction of labor which is the artificial initiation of labor. So one of the biggest differences between augmentation of labor and induction of labor is that in augmentation, there is some signs of labor. It could be effacement, it could be some dilatation, or maybe some mouth contractions. In induction of labor, you do not have any signs of labor. You are actually starting the labor. So what are the components of uh, augmentation? Well, like earlier mentioned, it starts after, augmentation starts after you've made the diagnosis of labor. And you must have a pathograph uh, when you're going to augment. It helps you to make critical decisions. You must do an ARM before you start your oxytocin. Um, very essential. If you start the argument in your labor with oxytocin without doing your ARM, that is the, a similar to driving a car with your foot on your brake. You know, you're working against yourself. And you should make sure that you deliver within 12 hours. That is the whole point of why you're argumenting in the first place. For some reason or another, you want to accelerate uh, the delivery. Augmentation is good in that it shortens the labor, you know, to at least less than 12 hours. And because, and because you act, uh, you act as soon as you pick up the problems, the incidence of cesarean sections and the need for you to use analgesia uh, is less. One of the most common indications for augmentation of labor is a prolonged latent phase of labor. Remember, that the latent phase is that phase between um, zero centimeters up to about three centimeters. Uh, that phase in our environment, uh, in our hospitals, that latent phase would take it to not go beyond eight hours. So if you've admitted a patient at 12 hours and you've made a diagnosis of latent phase of labor, make sure that by 20 hours, you review and you do something about it. If you won't be there at 20 hours, you leave clear instructions in your file to say at 20 hours, I want, for example, an ARIM to be done and oxytocin started. You don't want latent phase to go beyond eight hours, whether in primis or in multigravida. Another reason that we augment, of course, is prolonged at active phase of labor, which you detect on your pathograph. If you pathograph, there is some delay on your pathograph, maybe because of poor contractions. You want to augment those contractions with the uh, oxytocin. So how do we use this oxytocin for augmentation of labor? I'm sure uh, the few days that you've been on the ward, you've seen that the oxytocin that we have there can either be in vows of five international units or 10 international units. Uh -huh. What that means is that one international unit uh, is about, is, um, well not about, but it is 1,000 mil international units. So that five international units that you see is equal to 5,000 mil international units. Now, what is the dose for argumentation? The dose for argumentation is between 2.5 milli international units and 20 milli international units. And also now for you to deliver this, for you to deliver this properly, you have to take into consideration your giving sets. There are two types of giving sets that are supplied on our words country words. There's one that delivers one meal in 15 drops, and there's another one that delivers one meal in 20 drops. So every time, 
every time that you are going to augment labor with oxytocin, look at your giving set. Does it deliver one meal using 15 drops or does it deliver one meal in 20 drops? So now, what does that one meal mean? So when you deliver 15 drops, we're talking about, let's, let's talk about the 15 drops one. So when you deliver 15 drops, that one meal means one midi international unit. So if you've diluted, and this is the most common dilution that we see on our words, you find someone has diluted five international units in one liter of non-saline. What that means is the is they've taken five thousand mini international units in one thousand meals of saline or ringers. Remember that the oxytocin is compatible with ringers lactate or normal saline. We do not use oxytocin. Uh, we do not put it in dextrose, whether it's dextrose saline or five percent dextrose or ten percent dextrose. We do not use oxytocin, it is incompatible with those fluids. So, back to our five international units. So, that this 5,000 uh, mini international units diluted in 1,000 mils translates in five mini international units per meal. And remember that one meal, we are delivering it in 15 drops per minute. So when you deliver those 15 drops per minute, you are actually delivering 5 milli international units. So in summary, what this means is that when you go on the word and you found someone has taken one vial of oxytocin and that vial of oxytocin contains 5 international units and they've diluted it in 1000 mils of normal saline of ringers, what they are going to deliver if they are using a giving set that delivers 15 drops per minute, what they are going to deliver is 5 milli international units per minute. This is usually what we use in, you know, uh, Gravita 1, Gravita 2, Gravita 3, and so forth. But as you start going to Gravita 5, you may want to be more cautious. You may want to use less oxytocin. So what do you do? In a Gravita 5, as you are approaching the territory of high parity, like in a Gravita 5, you want to use a lower dose. And in this case, you use 2.5 milli international units per minute. How do you do that? You just get half. You just get half from your five uh, international units. You get half and you dilute it in one liter of normal saline or ringers. So what you deliver in a high in someone who's approaching high parity, you deliver about 2.5 milli units per minute. Remember, if you are not happy with the contractions uh, in the standard dose, in the standard dose, if you are not happy with the contractions that start at five um, interna uh, five milli international units, you can double the dose. You can double the dose. How do you double the dose? By, in, by doubling the rate. So if you are giving five milli international units and you want you want to double the dose, you go to 10 milli international units. To do that, you increase the rate from 15 to 30. And if you are still not happy, you can go to 60. That means you would have reached 20 milli international units per minute. And that is the maximum that you can use uh, to deliver oxytocin but there are certain cases eh? there are certain cases like preeclampsia where you don't want to give so much fluid eh? because the preeclamptic are predisposed to pulmonary edema cerebral edema and and you but there are situations where you want to deliver this preeclamptic quickly by the same uh, complications that may arise because of preeclampsia preeclampsia so in this case you get your 2.5 international units of oxytocin and deliver it in 500 mils normal saline or ringers so in reality in reality what you're actually giving here is five international units you are giving sorry you're giving five milli units per minute and because you have read you've halved you've halved the 
amount of fluid. So I give the same standard dose, which is 5 milli units per minute, but you are giving less fluids, and, and in that way, you are preventing complications of uh, cerebral edema or pulmonary edema. So you need to be careful with with the with the argumentation of oxytocin. For example, in in women that have got high parity, G6, G7, G8, as you are going to mount uh, grand multiparas, you want to you want to be very cautious uh, in using oxytocin. If I were you and I'm just starting out in the practice, I would avoid completely using oxytocin in high parity. You save yourself from many problems. Same applies to caesarean section. In someone who's got one previous caesarean section, it is strongly advised not to use uh, oxytocin to argument their labor. In short, not to argument their labor because the risk of rupture is very high. In big babies, of course, again, you don't want to. Uh, well, you don't want to use. Uh, you don't want to argument because uh, you may end up with a case of obstructed labor. Fetal distress, uh, fetal distress, remember that oxytocin on itself may cause um, hypertonic contractions, which on themselves may cause fetal distress or some form of fetal compromise. So you don't want, you don't want to use it, otherwise it may exacerbate the, the fetal distress. In multiple pregnancies, breach and malpositions, these are conditions that in themselves they carry certain risk of morbidity and mortality for both the mother and the baby. So you don't want to overlay risk on conditions that inherently are risky. So these contraindications that we have listed here um, would, would be safe, especially when you are starting, you would be safe if you avoid uh, giving oxytocin in this type of patients. You may see other practitioners give in a previ previous season section in a high parity and so forth. It's controversial, eh? but when you are starting out, you may want to stay away from controversial decision. So they may not be absolute, they may not be absolute, but uh, you need to be on the lookout because you may see one or two people giving oxytocin in multiple pregnancies and so forth. So in, con in conclusion, argumentation is a common procedure on our wants and we shouldn't confuse, confuse it with induction of labor. When we are inducing labor, we are actually starting the we are actually starting the labor, we are initiating the labor artificially. Then argumentation takes place in a woman who's already who already has some form of labor. So that's uh, all I had on argumentation of labor. Thank you for listening and I hope to see you on the next one.